When I've been to um, sessions in the past, it's always the major criticism has been not enough time to ask questions. Always the case. It is always the case. The things that you know you want to ask or explore. So that was the idea of the Q and A session. Um, I just want to introduce uh, everybody very quickly, except a couple of people very slowly because you haven't seen them before. Uh, to my left here, um, is Johannes Bendy. He is a student, a student at UTS, which is really good. Can you hear me? I didn't hear the name. Johannes Mendy. And uh, I'll just give you a little bit. Um, um, Johannes is, is German. He's, he was graduated. He came from a German high school, and he started a BSc in high applied physics in 2012. And he wants to be a successful entrepreneur. And he's a UPass leader, and, and uh, um, he, he kind of says that it's probably the most rewarding thing he's done at UTS. And um, I brought him along because the perspective we always try and imagine we've got, which we don't have, is the student perspective. It would be nice to have a lot of students, but we're speaking for a large community. <laughs> the other person I'd like to introduce who you haven't seen before, or, um, or, or you may have seen, is Pauline Ross. Pauline Ross is on my right. Um, she's an associate professor um, from the School of Science and Health at UWS, and she leads the Collaborative University's Biomedical Education Network, which is a big mouthful, but it abbreviates the CubeNet, so people might have heard of that. Now, I've known Pauline for many years, and her influence on um, higher education and science has been amazing um, over at least a decade. And she challenges it all, and she, she um, raises the bar um, whenever she speaks. Um, I'll also say that I did Google her, and this is a, this is, she wasn't expecting me to say this, but you can YouTube her on this, and it says, have you, have you, have you seen this? I, I, no, I don't watch uh, it. Right. Well, you better, you're sitting down, good. It says, I am fairly certain that Pauline Ross is the best lecturer in the known universe. <laughs> now, those people that have, you can, you can verify that. Pauline Ross, YouTube, and you can confirm that. I was going, wow. That's brilliant. Oh, the other, quickly, Sophie Riley, she spoke and uh, she presented from law. Um, uh, Tim Aubrey, on my immediate right, is from uh, IT and engineering. Yeah, this is good. And um, Peter is um, from IML, Institute for Media and Learning. And uh, so I'm Tony Jones now, okay? <laughs> Hopefully, uh, uh, I won't be as quite as nasty as he can be, but I've got, um, our first question comes from, uh, from um, Steph Beams. Yes, I have a question for you. Dying to ask, which is, how do we prepare our undergrads to engage in this kind of inquiry into learning or early stages of research? Because even with traditional forms of our classroom activities, I hear academics saying they're not ready, they're not prepared, they don't have the background. So if we want to skip forward to these more unstructured activities, what sort of early steps do we need to take if someone could help with that? Well, I think this is what we're Yes, it's totally, totally new to me, Les. Um, I think that... Um, if we're going to prepare our undergraduates, I mean, I've seen some lovely examples today. I feel a bit strange, in fact, being here now, um, because I'm from science, and scientists and science seems to act rather like a silos. You know, you do a unit or a subject. What do you call them here? I'm not 100 percent Subjects. Subjects. And you kind of operate rather independently, you know, in your little group, which exists in the unit. Because many science and arts, this applies to as well, um, students can do a range of different electives and they may not have a really coherent program. At my university, you can call this a, a it's called a non-key major, but it really means just a collection of everything that you like to combine together. Mm. Um, for the sciences and the arts, I think we need to take a whole of program approach which has everybody on site, all the academics on site, and so that they can develop then a curriculum which structures and stages research experiences for students from the first year. 
um, listening to the talks today, which I really enjoyed. In fact, I used it as an excuse to get out of a rather boring um, meeting that we were holding at UWS. It was fabulous to talk, but I said to my dean, I had to go. Um, listening to the talks, uh, particularly in engineering, Tim, I, I kind of noticed that you were saying, well, in my course, two-thirds of the way through, the students get this experience, but then in the same semester, I was thinking they could get the shock of a completely different experience in someone else's room where they're guessing what the lecturer or academic wants them to do and wants them to value. And just before I hand over to someone else, I think the other thing that we really have to prepare our undergraduates to engage in inquiry research is we need to get the assessment of those research processes sorted out. And if we don't have it sorted out amongst ourselves, um, and we're actually valuing the research, not valuing the product. I call it valuing the process mm -hmm. as much as we're valuing the product. You know, the products are the written or oral communications or the PowerPoints or something like that. But how are we assessing the process of those students working in groups together and in that interaction that employers say that they value? So I think we've got a challenge there. Um, anyone else from the panel want to? Oh, maybe uh, are you got following up on? on um... a, a little bit. Um, I think if we could get students straight from primary school, they would actually be much yeah. better prepared for this sort of learning than than students that come through from high school. I think what happens in high school is they have all that inquiry bashed out of them so that they can perform, you know, in this space for the HSC. Um, so I don't know how we address that problem, though. Yeah, I mean, actually, I'm supposed to be organising this, I shouldn't be speaking, but I mean, the thing is, it's bashed out in because the teachers have an agenda to get the students through their HSC. Yeah. And the so... The so teachers have a curriculum that they have to go through, you yeah. because the exams are written externally. So yeah. no, yeah, no. we're fighting a system, not just HSC. Yes. So I want to ask a question on top of this question that we were asked about students, and that is to ask how can we encourage academics to provide this kind of learning environment, knowing that in the next five years, a quarter of us are going to retire, so we're in an old workforce. Um, I think, judging by myself, I'm getting old, I'm set in my ways. How do we change that mindset? Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> There's a hospital pass about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, if you're expecting so. Thank you very much. Well, I think one of the, um, the main learning strategies is to watch other people in, in action as well. We've got the Learning 2014 um, fellows like Anne and um, others to try and show how you can do these things and that um, um, it is possible. I think the the reason people aren't changing is because they haven't experienced these things themselves. They come through in a particular undergraduate experience, maybe 20, 30 years ago, and it was taught differently. And so what we're asking them to do is to go into the great unknown without a lot of support, and it's not um, unreasonable for them to be a bit reluctant to jump in boots and all. So I think what we need to do is show them good examples of these sorts of things, how they work, and then have those conversations with individuals about what was needed to be able to make that step, take that step, make that transition. So having people who are like champions, able to demonstrate how this works, I think is the first step, and that breaks down some of the fear barrier, and then the next thing is to try it out themselves. Yeah, and I think uh, scientists should go into Jenna's class, and yes. Jenna should go into DUB, and so we should all, we should move out of our comfort zones, that's step one, because we all live in our comfort zone, and that's the question. Yeah. We do live in the comfort zone. Um, we always have to keep that little bit of control. We know even when we release a little bit, we keep a little bit. You go somewhere really alien and see how they do it and see what it feels like to be a student in there. And you learn an awful lot that you can actually use, not just um, you know, come away sort of, um, I said, just um, with, with, with fear in your heart, but you actually sort of get it inspired and say, look, we can do that, and understand how the students feel. So I think getting in, not just in contemporaries, but in other people's disciplines, no one ever, I, mean, I would say no one ever does that, someone says I do that all the time. Never ever seen that done. Never seen people from one discipline go into another discipline. 
and find out what goes on. Um, a bit more than five years ago, we had a guest lecturer, an emeritus professor. He um, sent in, sorry, let me start again. Um, a bit more than five years ago, we had a guest lecturer. Um, he was coming in for one three-hour le le lecture session. Um, he sent in some material that he wanted the students to actually have a look at so that they could discuss it in detail during his class. This was flipped learning. So he was actually requiring the students to actually um, take in that material in advance so he could focus on the discussion and exercises during the class. Um, he turned up for the class and the vast majority of the students had not even bothered to download the material. So once he'd identified that this was a problem, he said, okay, see ya, and he left. Um, so that example actually I think is, is very important because if the students are not going to put in the hard yards in advance, there's no point in, in us actually um, uh, utilizing um, these techniques. We need a way, and this relates to what people were saying about primary schools and, and getting the students involved and ready for it. But also, there are staff here who've had that experience of it not working. And, and how, how you actually make those students you know, buy into the process is a really big barrier, I think, to, um, to um, uh, you know, getting such techniques implemented. So my question is, how do we get the students to buy into the process? Because from the lecturer's point of view, he had done everything he could think of, and, and the supporting staff as well, to get the students to participate in this um, lecture. And they just didn't. So what do you do? <laughs> Me, students. Oh, yeah, you're students. <laughs> How do you react if you're asked to read and prepare? I think it's a very fair point to ask, because coming out of high school, you. I believe the first year for a lot of students is still sorting out. So we see you have a dropout rate from, I don't know, probably around 50% yes. of the first year. So I believe if you do something like this in first year, you have to expect at least half the people to not prepare because they don't even know if that's what they really want to do. A lot of people start one degree and then they notice, oh, that's not at all what I really want to do. So they don't put any effort into it. So you have to, I think, cater for both groups and try to challenge the people who are actually interested and genuinely want to study that, and, but not on the cost of, of everyone. If, he, if the lecture just leaves, then I'm sure there were a couple of students who were really interested and prepared and were happy to discuss. And well, it's on the cost of these people that the lecture leaves and that's not the solution. We got lots of warnings the following year. It did get a bit better in subsequent years. It was always an issue. So. I mean, I think, sorry, go on. I was going to say, I think it remains an issue when there are very few subjects doing this and it's not introduced early and they're not slowly introduced it over time. Um, it's, um, I think there are a lot of other things that, that work against, a lot of current practice that works against inquiry-based and flipped classes. So, for example, in my class, the one that I was talking about earlier, I really <coughs> noticed that students um, struggle with making mistakes. They don't like to make mistakes. And they expect to get the, they want to get the right answer. And I think that's because they're used to being punished for not getting the right answer. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you, you, you know, students have to understand what you're trying to do. And I, I, could, I could recount a little bit of feedback we got from uh, from recently in our, in our we, we have a survey, another survey, um, early, in the, early in the course where we asked students about subject delivery. Now what we're really asking is, is the room big enough, is it warm enough, is it cold enough or, or whatever, but what we end up inevitably getting is comments about students and I can tell you two comments that came in recently. One was at the end of the lecture, the lecturer asks us to make a summary of what we learnt. That's his job. <laughs> that was one. Another one related to somebody nearby <laughs> was um, something along the lines of, uh, what was it, something along, the lecture, I don't like the way this lecture, this person runs the subject, um, they're lazy, they just sit there while we have to do all the work. Um, 
and this was a flip, so more or less a flip thing, you know, you, you do some work, you come on and we discuss it. You know, there's a matter of, you know, but you persist at it, and I think that through persistence, we do eventually get a change in the way what students expect, and it's important that they understand what they expect. But if it's a one-off subject, it's very difficult. It was actually a one-off lecture. Well, a one-off lecture is even, even more difficult. Mm -hmm. I did exactly what this person did for about, mm -hmm. for about five weeks, and I said, you send me questions at least 24 hours before the lecture, and that's what I'll talk about in the class. I did this for a few weeks, and I didn't. The only question I got was something about, you know, when, when's the exam or something like that, <laughs> which didn't fill in the lecture time. Yeah. But eventually, I, I ran into Joe McKenzie. Um, I gave up in the end, and I said, "All right, you're not, you're not doing this. I'm happy to talk about what I think is interesting." Um, but Joe said, Look, "Just persist. You know, you, you persist. Um, you'll, you'll have to wear some some indifferent or bad SFS results, but." Not all of us think that SF's best results are the end be all and end all. Um, and you probably have to um, either fail more students or work out other ways of allowing them, like Keith does, to make up for it. This is just once, you know. And if you get them used to this earlier in the course, it's interesting. And going back to Jenna's question, I'm sorry, um, it's not just the students who we have to change their attitudes or we have to encourage them to think about other ways of learning. Um, staff have similar problems, you know, this, this whole, all of these new approaches, if you like, and they're not necessarily new, but these approaches that are becoming popular now, interesting now, um, challenge the identity of, of lecturers. You know, no longer are they the, the only expert, no longer the person that you must listen to. Um, and what I know, what I've noticed in our faculty is everybody in the faculty knows about this. There's no way people can not have heard this story that we're telling somewhere along the line. But very few are changing, and I think a lot of that is to do with people need help in changing. And they, they, you know, telling people how to do it doesn't actually get them to do it. I think we need to, to work in teams or in groups and, and actually work with people. Because um, I think there's a willingness to change, it's not an ability. But we're also not willing to walk the walk. I mean, um, the, the talk you gave earlier, I was all set to say, but in fact you actually got there first. Is, but in none of these sessions do, uh, are we actually asked to actually use these techniques that we're being taught. We have a whole set of research and um, teaching related retreats coming up. And I'll be shocked if we use any of the techniques that we've talked about in, in these sessions. Um, and um, so we're not walking the walk ourselves. And the other point, which is actually slightly separate, is that um, I get my first class this year for one of my subjects half the class did not turn up for the first lecture. And I get a proportion of students who um, don't come to classes as a regular habit. And it really impacts on how they do in the final exam. So I think that we're overlooking something that the students are getting out of content, which is that they remember it better if it's been um, presented to them in, uh, in, a, in a classroom in a way that they don't remember it if they read it online. And they know that, some of them. So, you know, let's not throw out the good of it with the bad. You know, there are reasons why students, the good students, show up for class. Yeah. I, mean, so, I, think, I think you said something about presentative, which is part, maybe is part of the issue about, you know, we are still in a presentation mode, has a place, it's trying to manage those things, where the students have some responsibility, you move them from a place in, their comfort zone to a place which is not so comfortable. And academics are saying, I think dropping them in like that one person you mentioned, expecting something miraculous in one lecture, that is truly miraculous because they've been, all their other experiences are totally different. One lecture in the middle of the semester is another one. I shouldn't be taught. Okay. Sophie, you've got just, to. Um, just some tips that I use, I don't know if they work across other subjects. Um, for the electives, not the compulsory subjects, so I prepare an electronic workbook that has um, different levels of readings. There's one that I would say to the students is compulsory, and I try to keep that minimal, no more than maybe 20 to 25 pages a week. Then I've got my wish list, <laughs> and it's up to them how much they dip into that. Then I've also got um, questions that go with the readings and I say to them, you know, the class discussion will be based on these and other issues that flow from them. And then the third thing is that they're assessed on their class participation. So if they don't do the readings and come prepared to discuss the materials, that's really obvious and they don't 
and then we sat on those marks. And, and um, as um, um, Tim said, um, I, I actually say to them at the beginning that in, in the tutorials or in class, mistakes are beautiful, but not so in the final exam. So, so that they know that that's how they learn. So that, you know, and they still get marks even if they say something that might not be technically correct. Tony, can I add something? Tony, or Tony. I'm sorry. Yeah, oh, I'm sorry, Tony. Tony. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Of course um, you can't. Yeah. I just want to uh, sort of pick up on a few of the points that have been made and that there, uh, I think the responsibility of the lecturer or whatever you'd like to call them, a person coordinating the class, is to create a structure whereby students can actually have a role in making better mistakes tomorrow, if you like. You know, it's the mistakes that they make within a structure that they can make mistakes in and be rewarded for it and then know that they are mistakes and that there's a right answer somewhere which they also get marks for. It is the process to take. When I introduced in about 1999, I sort of, I called it throw away the cookbook, practical set of series of investigations for first year biology. I was very aware that they wouldn't have the techniques that they would need to investigate the questions that I wanted them to. So we used to spend the first few weeks or at times during the semester learning those techniques which they could then use and, and that enabled them and Tim I think you spoke about these things online where they could learn the techniques or play around with the remote labs of a, an oscilloscope and it, it, they need to be able to use those but I think it's also our responsibility to create this structured environment which then allows for students at primary school level if you like it, you know what they do at primary school is create a lot of structure for inquiry. Um, and I got rid of the guest lecturer, I know, at one stage, because I wanted the frame, the frame of the investigator to be the student, mm -hmm. not to have the researcher come in and sort of impose on top of the students something else. I, I wanted to shift the frame. That's true. Um, I'd like to, to bring another perspective in here, and I'd like, uh, I think, um, excuse me, we haven't got a student here. I think Blair has a question for the student. Now, I'm just wondering, how often have you had the opportunity to do inquiry-oriented learning during a subject? Well, actually, when I was listening to Alison's talk, I realised that everything she talked about actually experienced exactly in that way. So, from first year on, I noticed that we, we get some input of people who do research. We had some people from the MAU come in and tell us about what they work on, just to get us excited about all this. And there was always kind of an open door for us. So we had, a, for me it was the case that we had a career day, I believe, and the, a lot of different people from different um, research projects had a little talk and in the end they offered us if we were interested then we should contact them so we could get into research as well so that's how I ended up in the MAU I just sent an email and there we go I was doing some research by myself so I think if students are really interested there was a lot of opportunity for students to get into it and I think everyone was yeah everyone was trying to get all the students excited about it you know, you might be a structural analysis unit for those who don't know the uh, three-letter actor in the TLA. Um, uh, okay, um, sorry, uh, did I no. fish? Okay, um, sorry, Kathy. Uh, um, we've heard some really, really creative um, ways that people are embedding research, but they're mostly, it looks like, individual-led um, and fairly small class sizes, third-year subjects, which obviously is a nice structure to do that. What about the situation that like many of us are in where we've got sometimes seven or eight um, repeats of practical classes, we've got uh, casual demonstrators that have a, a range of um, expertise and also enthusiasm. Um, how, do we, how do we structure more research-orientated learning activities or, or in, into that sort of environment where you're looking at 300 odd students spread over eight fact classes with... I, I noticed this because I, I, I noticed a discrepancy in student marks from my different 
classes and there were some of my demonstrators I, I was unable to enthuse in the way I, I hoped to. And I don't want to sack them, but... Um, yes, an excellent question. I know that Pauline has... Do you want to take it, or should I say something before you take it? Yeah, you can say. Um, what we, we have in our first year business class 500 students, 15 repeat labs. And you're quite right. The challenge there isn't designing an inquiry oriented activity. There is a challenge, but it isn't the challenge. The challenge is to translate what you think inquiry oriented learning is so that you've got some sort of common ground, not exactly the same. So we define research, there's 20 people in this room, we each define it slightly differently. It's so that the challenge is getting your demonstrators, your TAs, to believe in it, and not to take your idea and turn it into some sort of recipe type situation because they're comfortable with that. Um, how do you do that? Well, I mean, it's certainly having briefing sessions is one thing, but my opinion is there's nothing like having them and take out the comfort zone and have them do the, the, the laboratory, the experience with you as a demonstrator and have them see what you think it is. And whether or not it turns them completely around, that is a starting point. Put them in the situation, out of their comfort zone, realizing that they in turn will put their students in a different place. But don't write them another lab manual. Don't write them another demonstrator's manual. Don't do them another video or DVD. Get them in there in the daily part of it and actually have them doing it and see what they react and what their response is. Because they can help you feed into the next generation, not just telling them, but they'll be able to tell you how to improve it and it'll get them inside much more than you probably would any other way. Holy, sorry. Thank you, Liz. Um, just to continue, the last example that I gave you was with 500 students in first year biology. So we had quite a good, pretty much what Les just said, we had quite a nice teaching team. And, and that's the challenge, isn't it? Because to have a group of casual or sessional staff who are all on side and who are sustainable over time, because this is not just a one-off lab or a one-off event, it has to go on for a number of years if you're going to keep these approaches um, sustainable and, and somewhat valuable um, so that they also are learning as they're going and then can translate that over a series of years. Um, we used to have meetings about the process. What, what, would you, what would you say? And I used to use my marking budget to pay them to come. So, to, and then we wouldn't mark as much <laughs> because it was the process of creating it that was really important. Um, having said I didn't use my budget like that, we also sometimes used, I, I needed a marking budget because we would write these activities up as research reports type of things, um, which we try to do in class so that their time as a demonstrator was also spent on marking. I don't think that's particularly unusual. But then we used to give our students a chance to uh, revise their mistakes and rewrite their reports and bring them back again the following week and to tell us what they had learned over that week of reflection. Um, we also combined our, our demonstrators in mentor pairs so that they did an online blog with each other and which was coordinated by the teaching development unit or the equivalent of, um, you know, I don't know, what are they called? IML. 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 And uh, so there was an objective person from the outside uh, having a look at these blogs and, and um, seeing what processes we needed to feed back in. They were all very time intensive, must I add. And I could ask you, what, how, what is the solution there? I'm not so sure. I think you touched on something very important there, actually. I mean, the IML um, is a, a resource that I, I think in general we don't use enough of and I think the people there can help us. Um, maybe Peter says he is used enough and he can be overused. But overused. Well, probably, probably he had hours and hours of capacity every week. Unused capacity then. Yeah. Well, I'm just there's a lot good. that we can learn and I think sometimes the things that we do have been done before um, and we perhaps need to be pointed in the right direction. Anyway, I wonder, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a sensitive to the fact 
we're getting a little bit of science centric. So I want to ask, I know we have um, David. David, if I'm right, still here. David, I think you have a question. I do have a question. Yes, a question. The answer is I do have a question. It's, it's really so about, we've all sort of touched on it, but so what are the carrots for the students? Because a lot of this has been about the carrots for the academics, like in terms of HDRs and, and um, students, and just also feeling like it's really good that we can get up in the morning and know we're going to be teaching, not, you know, we're not going to be punishing. Um, sometimes I think we're all like the UN, because when the UN will, Constantly, what is, is doing things that no one is, anyone's disobeying. They still, there is still a UN. So I can see that the, the, the IOL stuff is, is good for us, good for our morale, and also it's good in terms of the research profile. But what is, what are the carrots? And maybe Les, I'll start with you. If you've picked up any good carrots from the presentations for the students, or what you're feeling about, what are the carrots for the students? What is, what is it for them? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it, it's definitely totally bleeding obvious. They'll come out with the capacity to um, tackle problems that haven't, they aren't well defined. I mean, the thing is, all the important problems in the world are ones that aren't well defined. There, there's an uncertainty. We try to teach things, or well, have we in the past, where we know exactly what you need to know, exactly how you need to know it. And that's exactly what you'll do when you leave. But we know that none of that's true. So the, the character, if you like, is better being better prepared to, to, for any future that you might um, go into in any career trajectory. You know, it is a question that we're asked when you sign on for a physics degree. Well, what will you do with a physics degree? We want, we want to know where we're going to sit in three years' time. What job will I get? Well, we know that we can't really tell them that. And we shouldn't tell you. It shouldn't be a job in mind that we want. What you, what you should have are the skills and the opportunities to be um, creative, inventive, and to make mistakes, and, to be, and, and not to be penalised for them. Do what scientists do. Scientists guess some of the time, the serendipity some of the time. Um, and we want them to benefit from that because it broadens your capacity to do all sorts of things. So the carrot is, you will be more employable because you're able to do many more things and think much more openly. Now, how you sell that is another issue. Do I believe it's true? I absolutely believe it's true. It's making it clear to a student who's coming into week one, who's just in the HSC, which has confined them for two years, that there's another world out there. Could Sorry, I just, yes. I would like to just back what Les was saying, because as he said when he introduced me, I want to be an entrepreneur. And when I talk to whoever and I tell them, that's, so why don't you study business? That's kind of the first choice everyone has if you want to become an entrepreneur. But then exactly what Les was saying comes into play here. If you study physics, or what my expectation was of studying physics at UTS was, that I get prepared for what the real world really is like, that I have to make mistakes, that I have to try again, and that I have to develop and be creative myself, exactly what an entrepreneur does, what maybe not the case is in business, you follow the rules. Which, and, and this approach, I think, is, is much closer to the real world than what you have in high school. So the, the carrots, as you want to call it, for the students is getting a chance to get away from what you had in high school. So you, that, that's, that's not going to work for the rest of your life. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's first year university, just year 13 at school. If it is, then you won't get a job somewhere else. Um, I don't think you really need to even ask that question, sort of, uh, David, because all you have to do is talk to the students and sort of ask them what learning experiences do they like, and they don't ever say they like to go to lectures. And if you talk to academics around the university, they say one of the most difficult things to do is to keep students in lectures. At first they turn up and then after week two they drop off and by week you know, 12, 13, hardly anyone's there unless you say it's, you know, revision for an exam. You ask the students, you know, what would you like to do? And they all say, I want to go to the labs or practical. And the more, the better. And then maybe tutorials are sort of second on the list. And then after that comes lectures. So whatever the carrot is, 
you don't really need to spell it out. So I think the students are already understanding. You know, the learning takes place with the practical hands-on experience, inquiry-based um, uh, sessions, and the lectures are something they have to go to. If they can get out of it, they will. They know the characters. Oh, Matt. Yeah, just following on from that point. Um, what evidence do we have that the students are actually getting the outcome that we want? So Johannes was talking about enjoying the process and being able to approach these problems. Do, do we have widespread evidence of those kind of outcomes? So how do we assess, how do we collect evidence from students? Mark. Matt. 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 How do we? Do we have good forms of evidence that we feel confident enough that we've got those qualities that we can say, hand on our heart, that we have our students, our students are being, are able to think critically? I mean, that's what all texts are and standards say now. I did have something else to say. Oh, I was going to say we give the multiple choice questions, that solves everything. <laughs> <laughs> 50 questions at the end of the first year, then that's it, it's sorted. Carry yeah. on. Yeah, so I, I don't think we have very good evidence because I don't think we're actually setting the right assessment tasks to get the evidence in the first place. I think we have um, multiple choice exams, which are proxies sort of for understandings, but you know, we say it's performance. I go have gone to exam meetings, I don't know, for the last 16 years and said, oh, my students are able to do critical analysis. Only once has anyone asked me for the evidence. And then I go and get their assessments. And go, here we go. And then they go, all right then, that's fine. So I don't think we've got any evidence and I think it's the next thing we're going to have to think about is how are we going to get evidence for this type of thing. I must say though when I've done focus group with students for these types of investigations the one thing that they say that they feel better about is themselves. They, I think we increase self-efficacy when we give our students opportunities to understand what they don't understand and to ask themselves questions how do I know what I know where I don't think that that happens in lectures very much. I'm not going to let you get away completely. Put all of that. They, um, but you, Paul, you, you don't give the multiple choice questions. So if you picked one thing that you do, you think that, that you do, that you think is a way of gathering evidence of in the way you assess them. What what advice could you give Matt as one little tip that he might gather evidence that's valuable to him to know if his students are actually learning something? Um, I do to give them all the choice less. I have to just admit to that. I'm oh, sorry. I <laughs> know no one's supposed to keep it as a secret. Right, but... <laughs> okay. Take that out of the video, right? <laughs> right. Because, you know, large questions. <laughs> I, I do try and give them good multiple choice questions, you know, that um, I did a whole project where we looked at summative exam questions across the College of um, Engineering, Biomedicine, Medicine, um, Nursing. And I was appalled by the level of our summative exams. Um, in fact, I used to know that it was the right question, the right response was there in the multiple choice, but I had to give the wrong response in the multiple choice and I would get that right, because that's what the lecturer was thinking. Does this sound familiar? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I don't know. Like, I think multiple, good multiple choice exams are hard to set. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I think shows my students do know something is when I set an assessment task on critical thinking, where they, in my exams, and in fact it's due on Friday, I haven't written it yet, but <laughs> is I set them um, literature uh, from you know 2013, 2012, and I asked them to identify aspects of the research and tell me why that um, author actually justified it that way. And sometimes I find mistakes, if I'm lucky, in papers, and I give them mistakes that the author's made in that paper, and I ask them to justify if the author is right or wrong. Then I know they're thinking. That's a nice question. Mm -hmm. George has got a question. Yes, it's not a question, it's just that I think maybe the culture in physics is different, because I can tell you that the culture in biological sciences, why students are there, I would say over 85%, if you ask them why they're there, they're there because they want to do well, they don't care about research, they want to do well so they can sit the GAM set and get the medicine. 
Not all of them. Not all, a majority <laughs> of students are doing that. That's their big aim. Every, nearly every second student I talk to, that's their big aim in life. Our largest group is medical science, and that's it, true for the vast majority of the students in your And school. I tell them, I say, look, really, you should enjoy the moment now, because I can tell you, you are not just competing with science students, you are competing with art students. They go, what do you mean? I said, I teach not with our medical students. Half of them are from a non-science background. Really? I said, yes, they're accountants, lawyers, and English teachers. And they go, oh my God. I said, so enjoy the moment now, and you might like research. So just be open-minded. But that's the thing we're up against a little bit in biological sciences. I'm going to add to that, which is that um, I teach not just the medical science co cohort, but other aspects of science. And we're getting an increasing proportion of students who do not care what they're studying. They're there to get a degree as fast as possible and doing the minimum amount of work. And really, if you could actually sort of um, give them one exam, multiple choice at the end, and all the notes online, that would be their idea of the perfect university okay. subject. Can we stop the system? The system might be doctors one day. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. They will. They will. Because that, the system there is encouraging precisely that kind of behaviour. Um, but these are another cohort. They they're not really interested in 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 anything in particular. They just know they need a degree in the same way that you used to need a school leavers certificate. And they're there to get the piece of paper that is the minimum thing that they need in order to get a job. Find a MOOC it for them. Sorry? Okay. Find a MOOC for them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I see Jane has got a question or a statement. Or no, a, no, I just want to enter into this, this discussion because I think everybody in this room has some students like that who are just very keen to get in and get out. And my policy now is to deal with them the way I deal with trolls on the internet and I confront them. And I have discussions about it in the classroom about why this is not a good way to learn. And it's certainly not an enjoyable way for them to teach. I'm not there to be the mother bird vomiting things up so they can swallow it. I'm just not. I'm not going to be in that kind of environment. And if they don't like it, they will go to somewhere that does do that. And they will not find an institution that is interested in learning and teaching and still doing it in that old way. And I don't think we should collaborate with these with this kind of old school thinking that is just sending from the HSC, which I would like to ban. <laughs> so, so you get you you're um, munging their expectation perhaps I, no I, this is for you Jen, I can't ask you a question. Um do you tell them week one first semester first year or when did you get this message that you're not going to be regurgitating in the presence? So I, um, from the very first, like oh, a week yeah. before they start, I told them that we're not following the timetable on day one, that they're going to be with, in a group for six hours. And they're all pretty shitty about that. Excuse my French, you're recording this. And <laughs> by the end of the six hours, they're either on board or they're choosing to leave. And I, I'm not just, I'm not going to put up with that stuff. And I don't care whether it's by the rules or this, that, or the other thing. I mean, I think we have a kind of systemic suppression of creative teaching because of things like timetabling and rooms that I would love to change dramatically. I'm sure Tim would love to change it too. And sometimes you have to do it by force of um, the collegial group of teachers. And so if they don't like it, they can go to something that's not us. Okay. Steve, sorry, Jim, I think Steve's got a yeah, uh, statement. Yeah, I just wanted to jump into the conversation as well and share something that I like to tell my students from time to time. And so I teach maths and statistics. And <laughs> yes, but, 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 sorry, my students learn maths and statistics. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, one, but one thing I like to share with them is that if all they can do at the end of that is perform calculations then they're going to be replaced by a calculator. <laughs> so it's the thinking and actually the problem solving that is going to help them be useful and be needed. <laughs> Just one thing then. I mean, I, I would sort of rail against what's been said there because I honestly believe the students aren't the bad guys here. And as much as it's the HSC and things like that, I think, you know, they come here, we need to get them next 
the invitations right, and then yeah, we've got to do, we've got to do the grunt work to get to get them enthused. I mean, every single student here has done has done something to get here. Has put some effort because all the you know they're the whatever percentage who, who got through to get here. And I don't think we should just say they're in it for the degree. And, and maybe the, 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 what we've got to do is say, well, really? <laughs> and I, I just don't think we should make them, we shouldn't criminalise their, their decisions. And I, I, I'm not the boy that's where this conversation is going. I just think, just to recount something, I visited Coventry University uh, in 2011. And they decided right from the beginning that they would give the students a project from the day they walked in, whether they were avionic students, whether they were mechanical students, civil, or, or every discipline offered a six week project that was open ended. And the avionic students had to design a, an airport, and the airport had certain. So they got the students doing what engineers do right from the beginning. And it wasn't there, was, there, there weren't any um, lectures, or not much of that. And the idea was to sort of to break the cycle of what might have had before they came to university, and give them some experience that looked like the sort of experience they might get at the end of the degree. Not at the, and, and in fact, it had an enormous effect on um, reducing the attrition rates. The problem with doing that, because for every good, there's a not so good. What do you do after six weeks? You know, do you go then back to um, right now come into the classroom and I'm going to talk to you? And each of the different sub-disciplines of engineering had a different view of that depending on what you're familiar with. You can make a difference from right at the beginning and uh, do something quite extraordinary and the students actually respond to it because they haven't got themselves set in the ways and, and had experiences of rote learning in the, in the classroom in, a, in, a, in, a high, in, a, in a higher education. And that's bold, but it does work. And the thing that you come with it, inquiry is it's hands on, it's authentic. It seems they're doing something, taking responsibility, and they're acting in a role that they think they might act in in three or four years' time. And it does work. Sustaining it is another matter. That's interesting. The, the um, question of sustaining um, has more or less been solved in engineering in Australia, in that Engineers Australia offer through uh, uh, an engineers with that board a challenge to all first year students and engineering communications. How people here from still involved in it? Um, now, now, runs, now runs that project through the first semester, so it's a semester-long project that all engineering students now undertake, and they have access to engineering Australia resources and challenges updated every semester. Is that a one subject of the, or is that all of the, all the doing the, the No, that's not all they do. They do some other stuff, but that's the focus of it. So it's built, the subject's built around the, the EWB channel. Um, all our students do it. Some universities choose to just give it to a handful of students that they think are going to be in the competition. So um, that's a different challenge every semester. Different challenge every semester that we don't have to think of. Mm. And, and they're real challenges. They're, they're communities around the world that have a real challenge. Um, at the end of the, the semester or at the end of the year, um, people from those communities come out and listen to the various um, to the winners, if you like, or the ones that have been put up for presentation. And does it contribute to their final grade? Yes, yes. yes. And, and the, the subject is called engineering communication. It probably should be renamed slightly, but they do do the presentations throughout it um, uh, that are also not nice the largest um, I'm sensitive to the time. Jimmy, do you want to begin a question? Or a statement, or a actually, what you want to mean? I just wanted to tie a few things together more than that. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, it, it seems that we've come from both from the teaching side and from the student side to a, a view that we want to change the culture. I mean, it was George that used the, the term culture, but I think it is there. There are cultural problems, and, and um, one of the things that I think, and so David's comment about about reinforcing or where's the carrot um, is. It's an interest. I, I, it, it struck me that, that um, research by teaching or, or research integrated teaching is a way of has for, been for us a way of, of achieving cultural change because we um, that uh, activity that Mary showed. You remember this? Uh, those of you who are here, Mary's slide, the one that was all gibberish. That was the abstract of the students' report on a. Um, an investigation they did. They tested 
the, um, the guidelines for dealing with paracetamol overdose. They, so they went and they found the recommendations for what you should do if someone overdoses with paracetamol. And they said, well, we'll go and test this. And they found out it was okay, but it was actually like switching on a it was like switching on a light for them. And it was like when they presented it to the rest of the group, it was like switching on on a light for the entire cohort because they were able to see that um, their research, that their, their their own research efforts could actually um, do something meaningful and also integrate with the other parts of the course. So that we talked about integration. So um, in response to David's comment, it was um, a huge piece of reinforcement for the students. So not just the long-term one about this will help me get jobs. It was an immediate one about this helps me to understand where I am in this whole process that I'm going through towards the degree. So it is a way of giving them, giving them um, immediate feedback and reinforcement, but it's also a way of achieving cultural change. Uh, that's, uh, that's my comment. Sorry, yeah. so well. Thank you. I'm sensitive to the time. I don't know if I can rang things up, but um, I, I, I would like to thank all the people on the um, panel here and all the presenters. I mean, the thing about what we term inquiry and research is different for each discipline. And I know, in a sense, that's one of the challenges of bringing people together. For me, the, the key issue is how much control are you prepared to give your students and responsibility? If you call to yourself, call yourself, and they will make you responsible for everything from the start to the finish of the degree. And that's what you don't want. You want to release that as fast as possible. I think in a step way, but not for everyone, maybe straight away. And I'm sure that when the students come out, irrespective of the discipline they're studying, law, engineering, science, that release of the control and the responsibility you give the students will make a big difference right from the beginning. And it makes for, in science, scientists, people have that experience. They can go on to do science research. They can, they can be prepared for almost any challenge they'll face in their professional career. So I'm hoping that we might continue this conversation as in have more of these where we debate and explore the value of research integrated or inquiry integrated learning. There's no doubt in my mind that it's the best thing for all the students irrespective. How we get it mainstreamed, how we get it spread out, how we get everybody believing it, and believing that the multiple choice should be thrown away, which is one of my little pet hits, by the way. That's another thing, it's not going to happen overnight. But if we get the momentum, we get Shelly Alexander's and Telegrams on site, I'm sure we can move much stronger in that direction to the benefit of the students, and in fact, enjoyable for the staff, who are actually a much more interesting time uh, delivering and supporting these sorts of activities.